In the previous videos, we focused on the dislocations in motion. In this video, we will answer a scientific question, where are those dislocations from? First, dislocations can form in the undeformed, freshly grown crystals. Those dislocations formed due to the internal stress during the crystal growth process. The internal stress may be caused by the temperature gradient, the presence of impurity, as well as the change in lattice structure and the parameters. Let's look at the micrographs down here. Those are optical images of a magnesium single crystal before any deformation. In both micrographs, you can see those speckles. Those speckles are etch pits from dislocations. These micrographs offer a strong experimental evidence that dislocations are present in crystals even before any plastic deformation. Before moving on, I want to quickly say something about dislocations formed due to the change in lattice structure or parameter. These dislocations are widely observed in the thin films grown using the epitaxial growth technique. If the difference of lattice parameters is large enough between the substrate and the thin film, interfacial dislocations or misfit dislocations will form to accommodate the differences in the lattice parameter of the substrate and the thin film. The dislocation density in the freshly grown crystals is quite low. Usually it ranges from 10 to the 9 or 10 to the 10 per meter square. After plastic deformation, the dislocation density can easily go up to 10 to the power of 12 per meter square. Next, we'll look at dislocations formed through plastic deformation. Assume we have a perfect crystal. In order to have the first dislocation, we need to trigger the nucleation event. Whenever we talk about nucleation, we have homogeneous nucleation and heterogeneous nucleation. On this slide, we'll focus on the homogeneous nucleation part. In this equation, E denotes the energy of creating a small dislocation loop with radius r in the perfect crystal. The equation looks rather complicated, but we can break that down into two parts. The first part of the equation depicts the increase in elastic energy. We know there is a strain field around dislocation lines. Therefore, by introducing a dislocation line into the system, we increase the elastic energy of the system. The second part of the equation depicts the work done by the applied stress to create this small dislocation loop. If we plot E as a function of R, you will see as R increases, E, the energy, increases initially, then decreases. If we do differentiation of the above equation, then we can obtain the critical radius of the dislocation loop as well as the maximum energy. Assuming we have no thermal energy involved, then EC can be set as zero. We can estimate the shear stress required to nucleate a dislocation. The next question is, is this expression reasonable to explain what we observed experimentally for the strength of metals? Let's use aluminum as an example. The shear modulus of aluminum is about 25 gigapascal. Then 25 gigapascal divided by 10 gives us 2.5 gigapascal. But experimentally, the pure aluminum exhibits the strength of only 0.01 gigapascal. Hence, the homogeneous nucleation model cannot explain why we have a lot of dislocations in the plastically deformed metals. Then, how about heterogeneous nucleation? Heterogeneous nucleation happens when there exists stress concentration from the impurity particles. Here shows the intersection of the material and the particle. Let's, for one minute, discard the concept of specific glide planes in crystal structures and just accept we have the glide cylinder here. When applying a large shear stress, a dislocation can nucleate at the interface of the particle and the material, as shown here. And this dislocation can grow along this glide cylinder and eventually form a dislocation loop. And there is a special name for these dislocation loops called prismatic loops. The stress level to activate heterogeneous nucleation of dislocations is estimated to be g over 33, 
Let's again use aluminum as the example. The shear modulus G of aluminum is about 25 gigapascal. Then 25 divided by 33 gives us about 0.8 gigapascal. This again is much larger than the 0.01 gigapascal people have observed in experiments. Hence, the heterogeneous nucleation model of dislocations cannot explain the large number of dislocations after deformation as well. In order to successfully explain the strength of metals as well as the high density of dislocations observed after plastic deformation, we need to turn away from the nucleation model to the dislocation multiplication model. The most widely used dislocation multiplication model is based on the Frank Reed source model. We have the dislocation line here, and only this part lies on the glide plane, while the parts outside, they are outside the glide plane, so they are sessile. Since the points A and B are pinned, the dislocation segment between A and B can bow out, and the points A and B can act as a dislocation source for multiplication called the Frank Reed source. Let's look at how Frank Reed source works. We start with a straight segment, A and B, and the letter L denotes the dislocation source size. After applying a shear stress, the dislocation line can bow out, and bow out even more like that. Notice these two segments. As the dislocation further grows, they can coalesce and form a loop, and the remnant part becomes a new dislocation. This process can continue operating and generate more and more dislocations from a single source. The micrograph on the left is a classical example showing how the Frank Reed source operates in a silicon single crystal. You can see it in many textbooks talking about dislocations and deformation. The example on the right is a GIF from Wikipedia showing how the Frank Reed source operates dynamically. A natural question to ask is, does the dislocation multiplication model can give us some reasonable value for the strength of the material. The shear stress that is required to operate the Frank Reed source is GB over L. L is the Frank Reed source size, which is usually about 10,000 times the size of the Burgess vector. And this is the size of the Frank Reed source. Let's again use aluminum as the example. The shear modulus of aluminum is about 25 gigapascal. Then the applied stress from this model is 0.025 gigapascal, which is very close to 0.01 gigapascal. So the dislocation multiplication model could successfully explain the strength observed in metallic systems. In addition to the Frank Root source, there are other dislocation sources. The example on the left shows the single arm source, which can be observed when deforming samples at a very small scale. In a polycrystalline material, grain boundaries can also act as dislocation sources. There are many mechanisms being proposed to explain how grain boundaries can act as dislocation sources. Here, I will only focus on one of them. Assume you have a dislocation source within the grain, and dislocations are emitted from this dislocation source. Dislocations will be blocked by the grain boundary, and create a stress field in the neighboring grain. The stress field will lower the energy barrier for dislocation multiplication from this part of the grain boundary, making grain boundaries effective sources for dislocations. In fact, the last example I give you will be a preview for what we are going to discuss in the next video, how dislocations can arrange themselves and form boundaries.